All right, good evening, I guess. Um, welcome to your first lecture for 8250. Um, first, we're going to do an introduction to the course, and then we'll get into the first week's lecture. Uh, the first week's lecture has a lot of slides, and I'm, I might cut off a little bit early so I can just, you know, not overwhelm everybody in their first day in this class. But we'll see how it goes. Okay, so... I'm going to talk about myself and describe who I am. Some of you I've met before. Some of you I met yesterday. Some I've met previously. Um, so it's a mix in here. Um, I'll talk about some of your best practices for success. But I mean, by now you're level two. You should know what your best practices for success in school is. So I'm not exactly going to be doing that in detail. Um, what you're going to be learning, evaluation, and how the hours are broken down. Okay. So I always like describing myself before I start teaching so that you guys know where I'm coming from and where my knowledge comes from. Um, I graduated from college in 96. I'm not a university graduate. I don't have a bunch of letters after my name. I'm just a college guy. Um, I've been unemployed roughly five or six weeks since 1996. I've been working in IT in one way or another since then. Um, I've been a professional developer ever since. Um, I have a full-time job outside of teaching. Teaching is my side gig or, you know, my hobby that pays me money. So I currently work for a company called Cadillac Technology. It's a division of another company called EFI Fiery, which I'm sure that nobody in here has ever heard of. Or very few of you have heard of any of these company names. Um, the company I work for was bought out in July by EFI. Um, and what do I do? It's kind of complicated. I'm a full stack web developer who also happens to administer the AWS environment, who used to do IT. Uh, also on top of that, I wore a lot of hats at work. Uh, thankfully, after the buyout, I've started wearing less hats, which is significantly less stressful. Um, it's kind of nice. Um, fun fact though, um, the print shop here at the school is actually run using EFI software. So we get bought out in July. Start of August, I go print some exams for a different course. I look at the bottom of the portal to where we go to print, send in a print job, and it says EFI at the bottom. I'm like, hey, I work for those people. So that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, they work in the um, print industry. EFI, basically their big market is big giant printers that print things really, really fast. Specifically, odds are your cereal boxes were probably printed on their printers. And your Amazon cardboard boxes were also probably printed on their printers. That's the market they work in. The, the company I work for, we, do, we deal with much smaller scale of printing. Uh, specifically, we deal with uh, large format printers. So printing signs and billboards and car wraps, that kind of stuff. So slightly smaller scale, more detailed work. Uh, so... What kind of person am I? Um, I tend to have a loose and easygoing teaching style. I am not super regimented, um, as you'll discover through the term. Uh, I've been told I'm sarcastic. Um, I don't know where that's coming from at all. But apparently I am. But if you didn't notice, I was being sarcastic. Um, I understand that life happens. Yes, it happens. It used to happen before COVID. It's happening a lot more since COVID. So if you get sick, no worries. Your visa doesn't get stamped in time for you to show up for school. No worries. Why am I doing that? Because I had a student that had a lecture yesterday. I couldn't come because their visa, their plane was landing today because their visa was late getting stamped. I don't worry about these things. It's life. Yeah, come in, have a seat. Uh, by the same token... Um, I don't suffer fools. Uh, by that, I mean uh, people that try to take advantage of the fact that I'm pretty easygoing. Um, if your dog peed on your laptop once, that happens. Your dog pees on your laptop three times in less than two months, it gets a little hard to believe. Either you got to come up with a better excuse or you got to train your dog. One or the other, or maybe a bit of both, actually. Um, and people think I'm joking. I'm using that as an example that actually has happened where I ran out of patience with someone where they're, I can't do my work, my dog peed on my laptop. That's the third time. And it's the same laptop. 
It they don't get fixed when a dog pees on it. Just saying. It's it's hard to believe. Um I've also been told I'm an equal opportunity offender. Um I've been known to roast students in class. Um don't take it personally. It's just who I am. Everybody's fair game. Uh that included my kids and their friends when they came over. So, you know, it's nothing more fun than roasting your kids' friends in their in your own house. Um so yeah. All right. So best practices for success. Attend the lectures and the labs. However, I'm going to put a caveat on that. Um, now my caveat was here before COVID. It's definitely here post-COVID. Um, I record my lectures. As most of you have probably noticed, I'm wearing a microphone and a camera right there. What does that mean? That means that probably normally within the same day or the next morning, but the lecture is posted online. If you're sick, don't come and make everybody else sick. The guidance from the school has been, if you're sick, you stay home. I don't take attendance. Don't care. So if you're sick, fine, shoot me off a message. Tell me that you're not going to be here. That's totally cool. Um, and at the end of the introduction, I'll talk about my lab policy also. Um, so the course moves pretty quickly. Missing one lecture can, you know, help you fall behind. The fact that I record my lectures allows you to catch up pretty quick. Um, you know, if you get stuck, fantastic. Um, just let me know. Now, this is where I'm going to put it one caveat about the I got sick uh, message. If you email me half an hour after either the midterm or the final exam has started, say that you're sick. Uh, sorry, that, I'm not buying that. Um, email me a hour after the exam is over saying you forgot to wake up. That also falls under the category of TFB. Um, so, you know, if you get sick, let me know ahead of time because odds are if you're sick and you're sick for a week, you could probably spend 10 seconds firing me off an email in that week. Um, that being said, you know, if you're in the hospital, whatever, that's a different story, but life happens. All right. Uh, all the course materials on Brights, there are PDF, um, documents of each of the books you need, uh, the chapters you need posted up there too. Uh, in the announcements, I'll be posting links to all the, you know, course reading. Uh, essentially the little chapters I'm, that are up there are basically meant to round out the lectures not to replace the lectures. It's just to help give you guys uh, the content in a slightly different wording. Sometimes, you know, why I say in class might not click, but then you read it and then it makes sense. Um, yeah, you should review the slides before the lecture. Uh, the slides have not changed in years, so they shouldn't be changing, we hope. Um, Anything that you need to know that is changing and or announcements and or what is due will be put up on announcements on Blackboard. I mean, sorry, Brightspace. I keep saying Blackboard. We haven't been on Blackboard for like six years, but I just keep saying Blackboard. It's, um, I will post like literally after when the recording is done, I'll post an announcement. It'll have what you should be working on, when it's due, you know, what you should be reading and that kind of stuff. Uh, complete the labs. You guys are in WDIA. Um, you guys know how important the labs are in this program. It's worth an awful lot of your grade. Like a lot of your grade. Because unlike the other database course that I teach, you don't have assignments, only labs. So the labs are worth a little more. Um, so labs that are late get a 20% deduction. You get a week to, you know, after it's due. After, if it's your late, then by more than one week, like you get an automatic zero. So try not to be too late. You know, unless you have a good excuse or, you know, it's the first time the dog pees on your laptop or whatever. It's all good. So ask questions. Don't be shy. Uh, I, I don't make fun of questions. Um, might make fun of something else, but I won't make fun of questions. Um, 
by now you should probably have classmates that you actually get along with that you can actually help you if you get stuck lean on each other uh, it's one of the most important things you can learn in college believe it or not um, and practice all right so what are you going to be learning and this is the breakdown week by week um, you're going to take an intro to data modeling starting today um, Next week will be uh, diagrams. Uh, week three, you're going to learn about normalization. Uh, normally, normalization is one of the more painful topics. Um, week four is going to be the database design process. Uh, week five is indexes and views. So the first four weeks is pretty much heavy duty theory. Week five is significantly more practical concepts. Um, week six is catching up to anything we missed and a small review for the midterm. Um, week seven, you're going to take your midterm in class. So you're going to come in, sit down, take a test. Uh, week eight, you get to have a break. Congrats. Um, come, when you come back from the break, uh, it's going to be more hands-on stuff. So uh, backup and restore and database security are the next couple of weeks. You're going to learn about triggers. Uh, triggers and store procedures and functions are actually a really cool topic. Um, a lot of people talk about how you know they're programming the database when they type in SQL. Sorry, you're not programming the database. You're interacting with the database. The trigger store procedures and functions is programming. It's an actual language. There's a language in almost every database server. Every database server has a slightly different language, but it has all the usual stuff you expect to find in a program language, including conditionals, loops, variables, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so week 11 and 12, you're going to take a small introduction on literally programming the database. Uh, week 13, we're going to learn about transactions. Uh, that's actually a really important topic. Um, the modern financial world would not exist without transactions. Um, and the week 14 is the final review. And week 15 is we all sit down and write the exam. So that's what you guys are looking down the pipe. So course breakdown is as follows 50 percent for your labs 10 percent it's basically five percent of your grade per lab miss two labs you cannot get an a plus it will be physically impossible for you to achieve it well unless you get 100 percent in absolutely everything else and i've never seen that um the midterm is 20 percent final exam is 30 percent so in this course there's not a ton of evaluation items so they're worth more so you really do need to try to get her done. And this is considered a 324 course. Um, three hours of theory, two hours in class, and an hour online. The good news is uh, years ago, um, before I even took over this course, the other prof that I was in charge decided that the one hour online is actually going to be used as part of the study time. So there are no extra hybrids, no extra little tasks. You have your labs and your tests. So when you see two hours of lab and four hours of study time, realistically, you're looking at two hours of lecture and four hours of study time for homework and and the lab. And honestly, depending on the labs, it might not take you that long. So even then, the study time isn't going to be that big. This is not that heavy a course. Uh, the only time it gets heavy is if you get stuck. And if you get stuck, come and see me, reach out to your peers. Don't allow yourself to stay stuck because then it's going to be not a good time. All right, now to talk about my lab policy. So all the labs are submitted online. Uh, the ones that had me yesterday for their lab, I've already heard the spiel. Um, come to lab if you need help, if you have questions. Since there's nothing to demo and nothing to submit in person, if you're not having any problems, and you don't have any questions, you don't need to come to lab. You can feel free to skip the lab. I will not be offended in any way, shape, or form, considering how late these labs run, seven to nine tonight, you know, not saying I don't want to, I don't want people there, but you know, if you don't need to come, you can just go home or go do whatever, go to your job, whatever it is you need to do. I'm cool with it. Um, which also follows up the following policy. If you're coming, planning to come to lab, come to the start of lab. Because if I sit alone in a room for half an hour, I leave. And I think that's fair. 
you know, what, am I going to sit there for half, like for two hours in a room by myself and do what? My laptop's not powerful enough to play games on. So, you know, trust me, I tried to play Genshin on this. It wasn't a good time. Like 12 frames per second is not fun. No. All right. So, any questions before I continue? Yes. So far, there have been multiple guests on Brightspace. Wow, well, they're here on your laptops. I'll just be patrolling, making sure people don't have the good old Discord going. I know what Discord sounds like. I also know what Teams sounds like. I also know what Slack sounds like. I know what, you know, Facebook Messenger sounds like. Don't be that person. And I once said that at the beginning of class. Make sure you turn off all your messaging tools. Literally, 10, ten seconds later, I'll hear, Shh. I'm like, come on. At least try to hide it. All right. Any other questions? All right, with, so without further ado, I'm going to dive into this week's content. Um, this deck has a lot of slides in it. And like I said, I tend to try to keep my lectures to about an hour and a half. Um, specifically, there's a reason for that is instead of doing a break after one hour where, you know, half the class gets up, walks out for a five minute break and they come back 20 minutes later. I'd rather just keep going for an hour and a half and just let everybody go half an hour earlier. On days where things are really heavy, then it might go a little later than that. But realistically, I try to aim for an hour and a half with no break in the middle instead. Uh, that being said, if you need to go use the little programmer's room, please feel free to go. I'm not going to stop you from leaving the room. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick review of some topics you should have covered last term. Um... Because I'm really not sure what you guys learn in level one database. Um, but I know you install MariaDB, which, you know, causes problems for this course. But that's, it is what it is. Um, we're going to talk about the basic parts of a table. We're going to do some definitions. So today is uh, word soup day. So we're just going to go over some terminology that you need to know. <clears throat> so. You guys learned, did you guys learn about primary keys last term? So you know roughly what a primary key is, or at least you know in practical use what a primary key is, I should say. So a primary key is a method to uniquely identify rows in a table. And you do it by creating keys for each row. And give me a second. I forgot why I hate this classroom. Okay. <clears throat> so, how do you uniquely identify rows in a table? You create keys for each row, and that makes sure that no two rows in a table are going to be exactly identical. So that way, if every row is unique in one way or another, that you can retrieve it. So what happens if you want to uniquely identify each row? Well, um, data would be duplicated. That's number one, because uh, you have no way to actually make sure that everything stays unique. In theory, you could put two rows of data that are the same in a database, but if you've got a primary key, at least you can still identify the two rows separately. If you don't have that primary key, you won't be able to identify those two rows separately from each other, which is bad. Um, over the years, I've had many students that have had the same name, like from one term to the other, or even in the same term. Um, I once had a class with four Mohammed Mohammeds. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of context. So therefore, you can't, I can't uniquely identify each Muhammad Muhammad, so their student numbers were the way I did it in their case. Um, 
So if data is duplicated, that means we can't count the rows properly because we won't get meaningful information from it because the data is not uniquely identified. Um, which also means the integrity, the quality, accuracy, and reliability of the database and the data in it goes sideways if you can't uniquely identify anything. Yes? That's what the point of the primary keys is. Uh, but in theory, you could have very similar data more than once, but you need to be able to uniquely identify each one, which is the point of making keys. Uh, the main role of keys is to form relationships with other tables. Uh, one of the main roles, I should say. Um, if the data is not unique and not organized with keys, how can you make relationships between things? Um, there's no way we could do the relationships without the keys. Writing queries would be exceptionally difficult and complex. Can you imagine a where clause, which you guys have learned about where clauses, where you have no way to uniquely identify a row, you know, select table where ID is equal to five. Instead, you go to go where first name is equal to Bob, last name is equal to Frank, you know, phone numbers, this. So suddenly you need like six or seven pieces to identify a row. It makes the queries terrible to work with. Yep. So there are three types of keys. Um, you get primary keys, which uniquely identify rows. Uh, it usually is one column. In modern database design, it tends to be one column. In somewhat older database design, often there was multiple columns. I was known as a composite key, which is actually the third item up there. Um, you got foreign keys, which is a field whose value is derived from the primary key of another table. So you guys learned about joins, right? And normally you joined across a foreign key to a primary key. The value in the foreign key match the value of the primary key in another table. So that's a foreign key. Now, these are not exclusive terms. A foreign key can also be a part of, a, of the primary key. Um, if it's part of a composite key, uh, a primary key could also be the foreign key if it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So insert any combination of these to make keys. They're not exclusive to each other. So technically you could have one that's three, which would be really bad to work with, but you know, it's doable. All right, so primary keys. It's four columns that uniquely identify each row in a database. Um, a key is typically a sequence of numbers. So in MySQL, there's a special attribute for uh, int fields called auto increment. Auto increment basically acts like a clicker. So if anybody here has ever participated in track and field where they're counting laps every time somebody goes by, they go click, 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 they count the laps. Or if anybody in here has ever um, seen the people, you know, when sometimes you're, you're, you're traveling through the city and you'll see a bunch of people sitting under an overpass in lawn chairs and they're sitting there hitting a clicker. They're counting kinds of cars going by. One person's counting trucks, one's counting cars, one's counting buses. You know, literally that's their job all day. Just sit there, go click, click, click every time a car goes by. Those are clickers. They only allow the number to go up, not down. So auto increment works the same way. Every time you add a row, it grabs the next bigger number, assigns it, Moves on, next one's gonna be the next number, next number, next number. The, um, in other database systems, uh, they have you know somewhat different ways of doing it. Oracle and Postgres have something called identity columns or serial columns. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server uses uh, GUID columns by default, uh, but they do support numeric keys also. Uh, but essentially, the value that goes in there is automatically assigned by the database and it is going to be unique. That's what's important about it. Um, a primary key cannot be null and it must be unique. You can't have a repeated value in your primary key. Second you try to do it, the database server will tell you to go fly a kite. It is a unique index. It will, does not allow duplicate values and it doesn't allow nulls. So. That's how it is. Um, 
So if none of the attributes in the table are suitable as a primary key, we'd use an auto-generated ID. Um, realistically, it's becoming more and more common to not use real-world pieces of data as primary keys and using auto-generated IDs instead. Uh, specifically, um, I'm going to actually use an example here at the school. Years and years and years and years ago, this is another prof that told me this. And we're talking, we're going back to, you know, early 80s. When Algonquin started opening up their doors to international students. So we're going back, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Um, things was good. You know, we put SIN numbers for Canadian students. Cool. Foreign exchange students or international students would get their passport number or their visa number or whatever put in. Until one day, uh, there was an issue. It just so happened that then they were using, you know, the SIN number as the unique identifier for the for the student. Uh, a student, an international student was coming in and it just so happened that their passport number matched the SIN number of a Canadian student. It couldn't go in because there was two copies of the same number in the system. They got around it. I think they just stuck a P in front of the person's passport number. But, you know, there was a bit of a redesign at that point uh, because they had to come up with something. Nowadays, can you guarantee, for example, let's say you're going to use a phone number. Anybody in here ever end up getting a reused phone number? Yeah, you know, you go to go get a cell phone, you get a new number. And this happened to me where I got my cell phone and literally a day after my cell phone, I started getting calls for someone else. I'm like, yeah, no, no. I don't owe you $10,000. No, I don't own that car that you're coming to repossess. No. It's just, so I, I actually had to go change my number. The number of calls I was getting was insane. I had to go change phone numbers like two days after I got it. So it was like rolling dice and hope I got a better number. So having a unique database I generated number at least guarantees nothing else. You're not going to get con um, conflicts of potential data. Um, SIN numbers, for example, you know, that's great. Um, they're unique in Canada. They're not unique in the world. Um, considering our SIN numbers follow almost the same pattern as a British, um, the British, I don't remember what it's called, but the British ID number, um, you know, and it's very similar to some passport numbers in other parts of the world because of the length of the number. Um, email addresses. Yeah, we're usually trying to keep those unique in the database, but how many of you have changed their email address at least once in your life? Yeah, a lot of people are like, I got a Gmail account when I was like six years old. It's been the same ever since. Well, there once was a time where every time you changed internet providers, you changed email addresses. That's just how the internet was. Internets, you know, email sucked back then. You didn't have a, a central place for all of it. Uh, driver's license numbers, fantastic. That works too. Uh, those don't change very often, but, you know, in theory, they could change. Um, specifically, if you lose your license and then you have to go retake the test, your driver's license number changes. There's no guarantee that's never going to change. All right, so now we're going to talk about foreign keys. So a foreign key is a primary key from another table that's used to form the relationship. Um, it does not have to follow the rule of the primary key. It doesn't need to be unique, and I don't remember why this is worded like this. Um, like it doesn't need to be unique. It needs to be unique in the source table, but in the destination table, it doesn't need to be unique. And it can be null. In theory, so for example, you place an order online. The order is in the system, but it hasn't been shipped yet. Therefore, the order does not have a shipping method tied to it yet. So when it's created, the shipping method will be null. Once they update it, that it's been shipped, then it gets a tracking number and probably a shipping method gets tied to it. FedEx, Pure Later, whatever. Um, a foreign key can be part of the primary key in the new table. Um, depending on what kind of relationships you're creating, it might actually be needed to uniquely identify the row. Um, this would fall under the category of a, um, a weak entity, which I'll be talking about later. So this moment the foreign key is part of the primary key, it can no longer be null. 
end of story, because if it's part of the primary key, it has to have a value. If it's not part of the primary key, then it can be null, because then it becomes optional. And since it follows a primary key, so you create a foreign key and it's derived from the primary key of another table, if the parent table uses multiple columns for its primary key, the child, the foreign key is going to have the same multiple columns. You have to always carry the entire key across. So essentially, it's designed to un help you find, uniquely find rows that are related to another row. That's its purpose. <clears throat> so a composite key. A composite key is a primary key that consists of more than one column. So sometimes you may have a case where you can use more than one column for the primary key. For example, you might have a SIN number, like you might have a, let's say, identification number. So it could be a SIN number, a passport number, whatever. And then maybe you have another column you use in there as a secondary column to help make it more unique. You know, uh, date of birth or something else. So when you the second you have more than one piece to the primary key, it's then known as a composite key. So if it makes sense to use existing columns in the table rather than adding an auto uh, ID, it will save some resources. However, one should decide whether or not saving those couple of bytes on the disk is worth making it more complicated on the other side. So way back in the day, way back, even before my time, when we really, really cared about disk space. And there's a few people in here that might be of the right vintage, let's say, to remember days where hard drives are measured in megabytes. Yeah. Or the good old floppy drives. Um, for example, my first summer job while I was in college was actually as a janitor at a community college in my hometown. And they had an old VAX computer. So a VAX Mini. If you guys don't know what VAX is, don't worry about it. The company that makes it has been bought out years ago. But the thing is, is they were built like tanks. Like they were indestructible, these machines. And it had a hard drive. It was about that big. 20 megabytes. The entirety of the student records fit in that 20 megabytes. That's two pictures on my cell phone. Just let's think about the proportion, right? So back then, if you didn't need to add something, you didn't add it. Because even adding three bytes to each record, after a while, you'd be using a, a K. Then you have, you know, a couple of thousand rows, you're using up half a megabyte and suddenly you're losing, you know, 5% of your disk just to your IDs on one table. So back in the day, we cared a lot. Nowadays, I mean, my phone's got 128 gigs of storage. It's a stupid phone. It was very rare to find a laptop now that doesn't have at least 500, you know, 500 gig drive in it. Disk space is not a premium. Uh, so this is where I tend to put in my bias because the person has been doing this for years. Use auto-generated keys whenever possible. Why? Disk space is not a problem. They are actually faster to work with. They make things easier to work with. They're easier to index. So tend to stick to auto-incremented unless you have a really good reason to not. You may end up working for a company of some sort, or an employer of some sort, I should say, not just a company, an employer of some sort where things are archaic. And that's how it's done there, because their system is so archaic. <clears throat> Government of Canada. <laughs> just saying, they've got some really ancient systems in there. Uh, and last term, I had a student that worked uh, in the banks, and he actually helped out as an IT person in one of their data centers. And he goes, yeah. Some of those computers are dating back from like the early 80s. They, you don't change things. You just leave them the way they are. 
because things get complicated. But if you're starting out fresh, try to do it the modern way. Okay, so here's an example of a composite key. And this is an Astosha of entity, which I'll be talking about a bit later. Uh, but essentially, it's, a, it's an entity that's going to link two tables, student and course, and uh, pop it into one place. And so student ID and course ID are both part of the primary key. It's a composite key. Another example would be um, a um, parent-child relationship, which would be a customer to order. In this case, the customer ID is the primary key of customer, and the order has a compound key, one of which is also part of the is also a foreign key. So you got the order ID plus the customer ID makes up the primary key of the order table. But customer ID is also a foreign key. Now, this is where I make a point of one thing. Realistically, this primary key is not needed. Let's think about it for a second. Every time you start a new order, it gets a new order number, right? I mean, place an order on Amazon, you're never gonna get the same number twice. You place an order at McDonald's, you're never going to have the same order number. You buy something at Loblaws, the receipt's going to have a different receipt number. Every single time a transaction starts, like a, a purchase starts, it's going to have a different number. So in this example, it's showing you about a primary key that also contains part of a foreign key. But I'm, I'm making a, a point here that, honestly, the customer does not need to be part of the primary key. But it's fine living as a foreign key because the order ID will always be unique. That's, that's my two cents on that one. Okay, so that's that was the quote unquote quick review, 20 minutes about keys. Okay, so when we talk about database tables, uh, all tables have a few things in common. It has a name. Every table has a name. You have to uniquely identify each bin of data. Columns also have a name. And this is where there's an important distinction here. A table name must be unique in the database. A column name must be unique to the table it's in. You could have a column called name in every single table in your database, but you can't have the column called name twice in the same table. On the other hand, if you have a table called person, you can never have another table called person because the table must name must be unique. The column name must be unique within the table. So it's a scope thing. You guys learned about scope, variable scope and yeah, okay. So picture it the same way, right? Where the names of certain things are in scope. So the database name must be unique to the server. The table name must be unique to the database. The column name must be unique to the table. So, you know, there's different scopes and the uniqueness requirements are, you know, self-contained upon those each of those levels. Well, yeah, it's just like one of those things where if I've got two people called Dave in class and I just shout out Dave, how am I gonna know which Dave I'm talking about, right? So the database server is just a computer program. It's not going to know which one you want. It's not going to know if you have two tables called person, how's it going to know which one you want? Therefore, each name must be unique. Um, rows are made up of a set of columns. And often there's a primary key. That's what lets you identify a single row of data. Uh, the example we, ha we have here is we have a table called person. There's a SIN number and a name. It's using the SIN number as the unique identifier. And if we look at the data they'd have in it, we could have John Doe repeated twice because that's not part of the primary key, but the SIN number must be unique for every row. Thus, that's the basic parts that identify a table. There's a lot more to it than that, but those are the basic parts. So the reason we were talking about tables is just to give you a quick refresher about last term. 
Specifically now we're going to talk about entities. So tables are the end result. So you guys already played, you know, you did select star from whatever table, ran some queries. Life was good. You looked at some data. You were playing with the physical representation. Before it gets to tables, as part of the design process, what you start identifying first are entities. So first definition of an entity. An entity is a person, a place, an object, an event, or a concept. In other words, this is where I summarize that big long block as it's a thing. Just, it's a thing. That exists somewhere in the environment around you for which whatever organization you're employed with wants to maintain data about. So, depending where you work, that thing that you're tracking changes. The school cares about tracking students, grades, courses, course assignments, uh, employee records, that the kind of things it cares about. It's going to collect data on that. The Environment Canada collects information about the weather. So they care about, you know, what's the temperature, what's the wind direction, what's the speed of the wind, what's the humidity, um, precipitation at that point in time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the things it cares about is completely different than what a school would care about, which again would be completely different than what, say, the CRA cares about you know, Canada Revenue Agency, for you, those of you that don't know what CRA stands for. You have a question? It's not a table yet. It's before it's a table. An entity is a concept you want to collect. The CRA cares about you as a person and how much money you've made and how much money you're tr you've paid in. That's basically what they worry about. Just... You know, anybody who's filled in Canadian taxes knows it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's basically what they care about. They care about money in, money out, and a resulting balance. An entity type is a collection of entities that share common properties. So often in database design, the term entity and entity type are used interchangeably. In this room, we have, at a high level, at least two entity types. Student, instructor. Skipping the fact that, you know, we've all got laptops and some of us have books and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to go with keep it nice and simple. There's two entity types or two entities in this room. Students, instructors. An instance is a single occurrence of an entity type. For example, for instructor, I am the one instance. You guys have other instructors, so those are different instances. We're not the same instructor. And when it comes to students, each of you are an instance. As far as the school is concerned, you are all the same thing. Not the same individual. You all have a name. You all have a date of birth. You all have an email address. You all have an address, uh, you know, an address where you live. You all have some sort of unique identification, whether it's a SIN number, passport number, student visa number. They collect the same information about every single one of you. So in that sense, every single one of you is an entity type. However, what uniquely makes you is makes you an instance. So the fact that, you know, your SIN number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Your name is John Doe. That is an instance of that data. The person sitting next to you has the exact same attributes as you do, as far as the school is concerned. It's just a different set of values in those attributes. So that's the difference between an entity slash entity type and an instance. The entity slash entity type describes the thing. The instance is a single iteration of that thing. Any Questions about that before I move on? Because that's a concept that needs to kind of be understood before I get too far ahead. Pretty much. There's a very minor difference between them. And it's more a contextual difference than an actual difference. So they can be used interchangeably with each other. An entity and an entity type is the same thing, essentially.
All right. I literally just finished doing this example with you guys as students, so skip that slide. So attributes. So, so far I talked about entities, right? So entity is a thing. Each of you is an instance. Attributes are the characteristics or properties of a given entity. Often we use nouns to describe them. And all attributes may have a value. Most of them usually have a value. It's possible they don't have a value, but they usually have a value. Again, let's go back to our student entity. Because that's something you guys should understand, right? Being a student. You and some uh, example of attributes that apply to a student. First name, last name, potentially a middle name, date of birth. Um, email address, phone number, potentially second phone number, you know, your cell phone number, your home phone number. Hey, some people have two sets of phone numbers, right? I mean, I have two phone numbers. I got my home phone number and I got my cell phone number. It's archaic. That's just too many people have my old phone number to just get rid of it. Um, you know, some of them might be mailing addresses as opposed to uh, address of residence. Um, gender, although they're pretty much not asking that anymore, but at one point they asked gender. Those are all things that help identify or describe a student. If you look at a professor, very similar pieces of information. We've got a name, we got a date of birth, we have, you know, our home address, potentially a mailing address, you know, there's a few other pieces that may not be the same, you know, date of employment versus date of enrollment. Those are different items, but they're very similar. Um, if we step away from people and we just start talking about describing um, a pet, an animal. So a veterinarian, yes. Did you have a question or is it just a hand? Okay. Yes, that's exactly what it is. So an entity instance is a set of attributes that belong to that same item. So to step away from humans and go to, let's say, let's talk about a vet, a veterinary, uh, veterinary hospital, we're talking about animals that come to visit. What would be some of the attributes we would see? Name, species, breed, potentially date of birth, but most people don't know when their animals were exactly born. So there's an estimated date of birth. You know, weight, color, et cetera, et cetera. Those kinds of pieces of information that uniquely identify an animal. Um, so those are attributes. As we as you work with data, and uh, you'll discover that a lot of things have way more pieces to it than you really realize. Um, what becomes challenging is deciding which attributes are actually important, which, you know, we'll talk about this stuff later in the design process, but you can't collect everything about everything. It gets a little absurd. There's only a few companies in the world that try to collect everything about everything. Hey, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, the NSA, CSIS in Canada. CSIS knows a lot about you, just so you know. Yeah, pretty much. Insert, you know, government agencies here where they try to collect as much information about everybody as they can. Usually you don't try to do that because it's absurd. The amount of data that you're collecting is totally useless for your use. So, Uh, I just basically finished describing this too. So an example of an attribute is basically a property of characteristics that identify an entity. And a person can be described by a SIN number in their name. That's just, I just did a more complicated example with the students. Relationships. Relationships describe how entities associate with one another. Often they're represented as verbs when you're actually writing things out. And there are three kinds. One to one, one to many, and many to many. So I will describe each of these 
separately in a minute. So the relationship describes how entities associate with one another. And this course is using something called crow's foot notation. Um, I'll, there's a few examples in the further slides about what, how the crow's foot looks like. And as we do ERD next week, we'll cover the crow's foot much better then. For example, we have here, this is a one-to-one -one relationship. A professor has an office. Each professor has one office. Each office can belong to one professor. So it's more like one desk in an office, but you know, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Unexpectedly occupied. I didn't lose track of time, did I? No. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> when we talk about entity relationship model constructs, there's the three pieces, right? Entities, attributes, and relationships, which is what I just finished talking about for the last half hour. So we know about entity instances, we know about the types. Um, usually an entity type corresponds to a table. An entity instance corresponds to a row in a table. So now we're bringing it back to what you learned last term. Attributes are the characteristics. They usually map out to fields or columns in a table. And the relationships are the links between them. So one to many relationship would be in a one prof to many students. In actual fact, this is actually not really like that. It's actually a many to many relationship because I have many courses. So I have many students, and you guys have many profs because you have, what, six courses per term? So you have at least potentially four or five profs, if not more. Okay, now to talk about entities a bit more. An entity should be an object that'll have many instances in the database. So if you're gonna create a table in a database, and the table is basically derived from the entity, you normally want to build a table that's gonna hold more than one row of data. If it's only gonna hold one row of data, that's kind of pointless defining a table for that. If it's only ever gonna have the one row. Um, odds are it's gonna be composed of multiple attributes. Again, a table that only has one column serves very little purpose. Like what would you put in this column? The, the only purpose I've ever seen for one of those is a really badly implemented log where it just kept inserting row after row in one column of log entries. And it was, why I'm saying it was a badly implemented version of it is this log table didn't have any dates. The dates are actually part of the data it inserted. So we could never actually search it for information. It was just this giant blob of pointless text. It was totally unusable. Um, and it should be an object that we're trying to model. Obviously, you're not going to put anything in your database that is not part of the scope of the project. For example, you're doing a database to track um, student activities. Would you put, I don't know, uh, weather reports? in a table and a database that tracks student activities? Not really. I mean, potentially, but no, I don't see that as a really, a, as a use case. It sometimes depends on the weather, but it's more or less, think more about a simpler level where, you know, the all the little kids are going to the museum this week. Who cares what the weather is. We just care, but we're about what kids are going if they have permission to be there. So what it, an entity should not be is a user of the database system itself. So you can model users in the sense that most database systems have multiple users. However, you're not gonna create an entity about a specific user. Can you imagine that you're gonna create a database and if every time you add a new user, you have to create a new table? And then suddenly you've got 10,000 users, so your database has 10,000 tables? How would that work? So you're not going to create an object for a specific user. You'll just create something that contains a list of users, but not specific items. And it should also not be output. 
for example, running a report of current sales, you know, select star from orders for the last seven days and give me an average of how the sales were over each day. That's an output. You're not going to model the output. You're going to model the data that gets used to generate the output. It's the program that worries about creating the output, not the database. So there's a difference between what gets put into the database and what end users see based on what's in that database. You don't worry about res output. You just worry about what's put into it. It's just the word object's a little misleading. It's just not necessarily an object. It's a thing. So it could be um, an object could be a person. It could be an event. For example, a concert series, Blues Fest. So you've got a concert series. And each of the concerts that are playing are events. They're things, but they're ephemeral, right? That event happens at a time and at a place and it has a certain act. But it's it's an ephemeral concept as in that thing does not really exist. You know what you know what I mean? Like like this class exists, yes, as a concept. It's at a time, it's at a place, and there's people here. But the class the concept of the class itself does not exist. But it is something you want to model because it's a concept. It's a thing. It's an event. Um, so it's anything that answers the question. It's who, what, where, when. The only one you never really tend to put in there very often is why. I mean, there's cases where you're going to want the why, like criminal tracking systems and, you know, customer support has whys. But most of the time, it's who, what, when, and where is the things we worry about. This class is a perfect example, right? There's a what, CSD8250. There's a where, B370. There's a when, Wednesdays at 5. And a who, well, there's two groups of who's, right? Instructors and students. So this class is an ephemeral concept made out of multiple other entities that are associated by the relationship. So that's what it means by an object. It's not necessarily an object in the sense of my clicker. It's a, an object eventually, probably in the in your application code, once you've done creating your database and you're actually writing code, might end up being an object code, but essentially it's something that we're trying to model. It's a thing, whether it's time or place or whatever. So. There are two kinds of entities. There's strong entities and weak entities. A strong entity has a primary key that identifies it. It can exist independent of other objects. A customer is a strong entity. It can exist in a customer tracking system, irrelevant of anything else in the system. It is a self contained, self identifying object. A weak entity does not have a primary key and it depends on another entity to exist. It's like that, you know, that we all had a friend like that when we went to school that did not exist unless they had a significant other because they were so weak. Whether it was their best friend, their, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever friend, they cannot exist without something to prove that they exist. A weak entity in a database is like that. It does not have its own primary key. It must have something else for it to exist. An example of this in, in a business system would be an order. An order cannot exist without a customer. Imagine if you work for a company where you just generate orders, but they're never associated with anybody. You're just fabricating orders. Look at this. We're selling stuff, but they're not connected to any customers. Therefore, the orders are weak because they need a customer to exist. Otherwise, they, it's not valid. And then the order details cannot exist without an order. 
My favorite example of this is walk into Loblaws, grab a pack of bananas, go to self serve checkout, slap it on the scale, 4011. Yes, I know what the code for bananas is. Don't ask me why I happen to know what that bananas is. I don't know any of the others, but I know bananas. Right? And then I pay. At that point, a receipt comes out, correct? On this receipt, it shows that I bought three pounds of bananas. That entry on that receipt cannot exist unless a receipt was created and completed. So therefore, the fact that I just bought those bananas is a weak entity, depending on the fact that I need a receipt to prove that I bought those bananas, right? So that is an example of a weak entity. And it's a, basically, it's a piece of data in a database that cannot exist without something else to prove that it exists. Oh, yeah, a branch on a tree can't exist without the tree trunk, unless the branch falls out and hits the ground. Realistically, on a live tree, the branch needs to be connected to the trunk. The branches can't live without the trunk. Um, leaves cannot exist without a tree branch. So the difference that's the difference between a strong and a weak entity. Um, so back to the difference between a strong and a weak entity. A loan is a strong entity. You go to the bank, you get approved, they give you money. That loan exists. Now, you got to pay it. Now, can you imagine if you just walked into the bank one day and say, I want to make a payment on a loan. They go, but you don't have a loan. I go, I still want to make a payment. Well, that's not how that works. A payment cannot exist for you unless you have a loan. Or at least you're paying against an existing loan of some sort. So a payment is a weak entity because it cannot exist without a loan. Imagine you called up CIBC and you say, hey, I want to pay 100 bucks on a Visa card. You don't have a Visa card with CIBC. I don't care. I want to give you $100. They're just going to look at you and think you're nuts because that payment requires something to tie it to, which would be a credit card or a loan. That's a, there, There's a strong entity and a weak entity. The loan is a strong entity because it stands on its own. It's tied to you, but it is, it's able to exist unto itself. The payment cannot exist without a loan. And now for attributes. All right. An attribute is a property or characteristic of an entity or relationship type. Um, there's a few different classifications. And we'll go over these in a fair amount of detail. Um, there's required versus optional attributes. Simple versus composite, single-valued versus multi-valued, stored versus derived, and then identifiers. Um, that's the ones we're going to go over. All right. Required versus optional. A required attribute is a, an attribute or a column in a database table that must have a value. If you are going to create an instance of that record, it must have a value in that attribute. An example for a student would be a date of birth. You register, they won't let you put it, you, they won't let you get put into the system unless you provide a date of birth. End of story, do not pass go. Not gonna collect $200. You don't have the date of birth, record will not be created until it's provided. Optional would be an attribute where not every instance is gonna have that value. For example, secondary phone number. Nowadays, most people only have one phone number, and usually it's their cell phone number. For a while, there was a transitionary period where you might have a cell phone number and a home phone number, and before you had a home phone number. Or another example would be home personal phone number, work phone number, like the banks will ask you, you know, do you have a work number? So that, you know, if you don't pay your bills, they can start hunting you down at work too. However, the work number might be optional because the person might not be employed or they may not actually have a work number. So that is an optional attribute where an entity can exist without that information. 
So a date of birth would be mandatory for a student. A primary phone number might be mandatory for a student. Primary email address might be mandatory for a student. But a secondary phone number, secondary email are optional because not everybody will have those. Okay. Simple versus composite. A simple attribute is the easiest one to understand. It's a single attribute that can hold one value at a time and only one value. Back to date of birth. Does anybody in this room have more than one date of birth? No. That would make you very exceptional. A date of birth is a symbol, a single, a simple attribute. It contains only one value and only ever one value. As opposed to that, a composite attribute that is an attribute that has meaningful components to it. In other words, it could actually be broken down into smaller pieces. A good example of that is an address. Often, you know, you go to someone and you say, what's your address? The human brain's really clever. It knows when you ask for the person's address that they want the street address, the city, the province or state or whatever, a postal code, maybe a country, depending on what the circumstances are. But we all understand that when you say, can I have your address? An address is made up of multiple pieces. So an address is known as a composite attribute. It's an attribute made up of multiple pieces. As part of the design process, we get rid of composite attributes. But when you're doing the initial design phase, it's okay to have them around because, you know, it's a concept. It's not a physical implementation. Um, another example of that would be a person's name. I go, what's your name? And most people will answer with their first name and their last name. You know, on the first time you get introduced, you know, what's your name? And you'll go, you know, my name is Bob Frank. Cool. However, in a database system, when you talk about a person's name, you realize it's actually a composite attribute because it's a person's name can be made up out of a first name, potentially a middle name, and a last name. And depending what part of the world you're from, they might have two first names, an infinite number of middle names, and a last name. So an example of multiple first names applies here in Canada. So a lot of people that aren't from Canada don't know that, but most French Catholic baptized males' first name is Joseph. All their names are Joseph. However, that's not our given name. That is just Joseph. My father's name was Joseph Joseph. It was just weird. But it, it's a thing. You go and talk to a sad student from Puerto Rico who had six middle names. Basically, they just keep taking the father's, the most recent father's name and tack it to the front of all the other names, and the middle name just keeps getting bigger and bigger. He could trace, trace his entire ancestry based on his middle name. And he was a fun student to have because he actually responded to every single one of those names. And he used to say, you knew you were in trouble when your mother's still saying your name 30 seconds after she started. <laughs> but, you know, depending on what parts of the world you come from, you may have multiple middle names. So the composite part gets complicated depending on where you're from. Some, uh, some countries around the world, some people don't even have a last name. They just have a first name. India is big for that. A lot of uh, a lot of families in India, girls don't have a last name. They just got their first name. And they, they come to Canada and they got to put in a first and last name, so they put in their first name twice. It's kind of cool. That's just how it is, depending on what part of the world you're from. So even the composite attributes get complicated, depending on what you're dealing with. However, a safe way of doing it is that breakdown there. First, middle, and last name. Or even better, just keep it simple and just do first and last name and don't worry about the middle name. But that is a composite attribute, whereas the simple one would be a course code and a course name. All right, so now we got multi-valued and derived attributes. These are on the same slide, but they're two totally different concepts. 
So I'll start with the multi-valued. Multi-valued attributes is a list. So the definition is, is a value that may take on uh, more than one value for any given instance. So if a perfect example of that is a person's skill set. I come up to you and I say, what are your skills? So there's one of you, and then you list off the skills you have. And, you know, the list of skills will be different from person to person. Everybody has different skills. Everybody has at least one skill. But the list may be longer depending on what you do for a living, how long you've been doing it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So skill is a multi-valued attribute. You think of it as a list of values. You know, yes, what well, Dan, what are your skills? Database design, SQL, PHP, JavaScript, HTML, Visual Basic, way back in the day. You know, C Sharp, way back in the day, it's been years. Python, but it's been a while. You know, those are my skills. Uh, AWS administration, you know, VPCs, subnetting, networking, all that crap. Those are all skills that I have. Now, if I go up to one of you and I say, what are your skills? The list might be completely different, especially if you're just starting out. But you might even be of a certain vintage where you do have a, a solid set of skills, but you're now retraining for a new career. So I once had a student, I go, what are your skills? And the guy started rattling off a bunch of stuff. I had no idea what he was talking about. Oh, that's really cool. What did you used to do? He goes, I was a, um avio avion avionics engineer. He designed fighter planes. I'm going, cool. I don't know what any of that crap is. Good job. But your physics skills are way better than mine. And, you know, that was his skills that he had. And he was coming back in and he had no computer skills. His were all like literally paper skills. I mean, he had computer skills as in he could use AutoCAD. Or SolidWorks, actually. But that's where skills, that's a list of values. So you got simple attributes and composite attributes, which are basically single valued fields, whereas you have a multi valued attribute, which is a field that contains multiple values. As part of the design process, we get rid of those. We try to find another way to model them because they're terrible to work with. Imagine a common delimited, common delimited list of values in a single field, and you need to search for one value for everybody. It's really bad. A derived attribute is a any attribute whose value can be calculated based on an other or a combination of other attributes. A good one I like to use is age. You will never store age in a database. You would store a date of birth. Why? Now minus date of birth equals age. Another example is in a order entry system. Often the line total is not included. For those of you that don't know what a line total is, it is usually price times quantity equals subtotal for that line. You add up all the subtotals and that gives you the grand total. However, you would not necessarily include the line total because you can derive the line total from the math of every other piece. Price times quantity plus tax, you know, equals line total. There could be a discount. So you could do price times quantity minus discount, or it could be price minus discounts times quantity, depending on how you, the math is done on your system. So the, it can get complicated how the discounts are applied. But you could literally say, you know, price minus discount times taxes equals line total. Basically, the line total can be calculated from everything else in the system. So you wouldn't necessarily store it, except for performance reasons. A little mom and pop shop does not need to track the line totals. Amazon keeps track of the line totals. Why? Because they have so much data that it makes no sense to recalculate every single time they pull up an order. So derived attributes are any attributes that can be populated based on the values of other columns, and it has to be self-contained within the database. So none of the values are external to the data. 
This only value can be calculated based on the data in the system. And you normally don't store those unless there's a good reason. The reason usually is performance. If your queries are running slow, you may need to add derived table, those derived values in there just to keep things on the up and up. Okay. Time is it? Okay, I'm stopping in 15 minutes. We're going to get way through most of this today. So, by the way, this is the worst slide deck of the term, <laughs> just so you know. Um, defining attributes. So when you start defining attributes, uh, there's a few things you need to do. You need to state what the attribute is and why it's important. So this is part of the design and discovery process. So as you're starting to work against um, the database, and you're trying to document what you're doing. You are going to define what the attributes are, and you're going to say why is it important. You need to justify why you're collecting information. If a person's age is irrelevant, therefore you have to justify why you track their date of birth. If you don't need their date of birth, then you don't include it. So you have to justify why something would be important. Um, you always make it clear what is and is not included in the attributes values. For example, you go, we're going to track a person's name. The only thing allowed to go in that field is a person's name. You can't put the name of their town. You can't put the name of their pet. You can't put their date of birth. Only the name goes into that field and nothing else. You have to make it clear why, what that is. So, if, you know, when you're doing initial design, you're doing some initial collections, you have to explain why. Uh, if it potentially has more than one name in the real world, you should include those aliases. Back to the whole entity versus entity type. They are essentially the same thing. So maybe you're going to create an object called entity, but you're also in the documentation say this is also known as an entity type. Uh, in some companies, they could, the word sale and order are synonymous. An order is a sale. A sale is an order. If you go talk to the sales reps, they're going to say, yeah, I made five sales today. You go talk to the person in order entry, they go, I, I created five orders today. But they're the same thing. They just have alternate names depending on who it is that's dealing with it. By the way, that's a really bad thing to do in an organization. Everybody should use the same words. But in the real world? People don't use the same words. You should store, state the source of the values, as in, where does this information come from? For example, we track date of birth. Where does this information come from? From the client. The client provides us the date of birth. We don't manufacture them. Um, you should also state whether the attribute can be changed once it's set. You put in a person's name, and you say, can they change their name? Realistically, yes, people's names change all the time. I had uh, I used to work with someone who changed his name three times at the time I worked with them because they couldn't make up their mind what they wanted to be called. It's just, you know, some people just aren't happy with who they are and they kept changing their names. Um, for example, names can be changed, but maybe the primary key cannot be changed because it should never be changed. Um, you should specify whether it's required or optional. Again, a date of birth is probably required for a student. However, secondary phone number is optional. So when you start defining the attributes, you have to say whether it's required or optional. Um, so then you start talking about the min and the max number of occurrences allowed and the relationships between, between other attributes. I'm going to not really talk about that very much because I'll talk cover it later, um, later in the term. But essentially, you're just going to state how many times a given thing can be in there. So now you're going to identify the keys. We've already covered this, so I'm not going to go in detail. But, you know, you define your if any of these attributes or identifiers. You say if they're composite or not. Uh, as part of the design process, initially, they're going to be candidate keys or candidate identifiers because you haven't finalized the design. Once it's finalized, then it becomes the identifier. Up till it's finalized, they're a candidate. It's a bit like in Canada where you got party leaders and they're all candidates until their party gets elected and then they're identified as a leader of the country, the prime minister. 
Up till then, they're just candidates because we haven't decided which one it's going to be. It's the same thing with the data. When you're initially looking at the data, you're going to see maybe three or four columns that could be used as identifiers if you're not going to be using, you know, generated keys. And you go, okay, there's three possible identifiers. We will design, and towards the end, one of those potential candidate identifiers will become an identifier as you do a process of elimination and you decide what's actually important. So going back to a course, if you got an identifier of code and then you got the title, would this technically be a good design? Notwithstanding the fact that I personally never use a course code as a primary primary identifier, but overall, is it a good way of taking care of this? In theory, it's not necessarily a bad design. It's not a great design, but it's not a bad design. So if we go back to the program you're in, you guys are in WDIA. Four years ago, I think it was roughly three years ago, the program changed names. It used to be called WDIA. The letters were in a different order. The course code stayed the same. So as long as the code never needs to change, we can change the description of the course. Um, another example is CST8215, 8215. It's the other database course I teach, which is a data, first database course for a computer programmer and the engineer technology students. That course used to be just called 8215 Database, recently changed to be Introduction to Database. Things can change names, but the course code should never change. So is this a good design? It's an acceptable design. Not necessarily the fastest way to look things up, especially if you're sorting alphabetically, but you know, it's workable. <laughs> So if we start talking about identifiers and specifically keys, um, this is where things get a little wild. So there's some design decisions that have to happen in this kind of environment. And this is when you guys should roughly understand. So you could have a course that has a code, a section, and a title. Or you could have one where the course is has a unique course number and then has a code, a section, and a title. That means that, in theory, you could run the same course with the same section with the same name multiple times because the course number is unique. Realistically, both of these are terrible designs. It's terrible to work with. What you would have is you'd have a course, you'd have a program, you'd have a term, like 23W, and then you'd have an associative table in the middle that connects all three of these, and that would be the section. So for you guys, you might not quite realize that, but for every single course you have, the section is actually three things. It's a course, it's a term, and it's a um, program, right? So that course is offered at that time for that program. So you got three pieces that make it up, and then that's, that makes up a section. So 23W, 8250, section 300. For you guys, you know, there's not a lot of sections in WDIA. It's a smaller program. If we start thinking about computer programmer and computer engineering technology, last term, we had seven sections of the database course. At 80 students per section, minimum. Actually, one section had 120. Mine had 120 students. So at that point, you got two programs that share a course. And there's the time, 22 fall, and there was a course, and then there was all the different sections for each of those. So suddenly we added a, there was like seven entries of the combination of those three for that term. So the primary key was actually a four-part primary key that was then tied to the students. So each student was assigned to one section. 
Um, course management is a really interesting topic. It's really complicated when people people don't think about how complicated it really is. I'd hate to be the planning people at the school. So criteria for identifiers. You're going to choose identifiers that will not change in value and that will never be null. At the school, what was their fix for the conflict on unique identifiers? Can anybody take a guess at what the fix was? It's actually a really obvious fix. No. They created student numbers. Up till then, your student number was your SIN number. That's how they found you in the system. You didn't have a 040, blah, 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 blah. Literally, it's like, what am I? so who are you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's who I am. And that's how they identified you in the system was by your SIN number before they created the student number. Somewhere along the way, somebody realized that this was a bad idea to use that kind of information to uniquely identify people. So that everybody got a student number. All the schools went through this at some point. Uh, in Ontario, all students have a unique student number. Um, I don't remember what it's called. OEN? Ontario Education Number? Something like that. So technically, even though you have a student number here at the college, somewhere in Ontario's education ministry, you have a unique number that ties to your student number here. All the high school students that went through Ontario here know about that number because you used it. My daughter remember, still remembers her high school phone student number. So you will choose identifiers that it will never be null and that will never change in value. You try to avoid intelligent identifiers. Intelligent identifiers are identifiers where somebody says, I'm going to be clever and I'm going to use person's name as the unique identifier. Usually when you hear someone say, I'm going to use an intelligent identifier, it means they're actually using a non-intelligent identifier. They're using something really stupid. There's no such thing as an intelligent identifier. The phrase intelligent identifier is literally a sarcastic phrase in computing. Um, anything that can change, phone numbers can change, email addresses can change, um, names can change. Your SIN number can change here in Canada. And it's happening more and more. When does a person's SIN number change? When your identity gets stolen. Identity theft happens. You end up applying, as part of the process, you end up applying for a new SIN number. And you start all over. Then you got to go to the banks and change all your SIN number and all your accounts and all that jazz so that, you know, you start fresh. It happens. So you avoid intelligent identifiers. Uh, if you got really long complex keys or really long composite keys, often you'll want to just substitute it for newer, simpler keys, usually a surrogate key or a generated key, a unique key that way. All right. So this brings me to slide 36, which is relationships. It is uh, 6.30. Everybody's brains are melting out of their ears because there's so much information in the last hour and a bit. So this is where I'm going to pull the plug for tonight. So as a quick iteration, I will post the recorded lecture. Hopefully by the end of the day today, I'll be rendering it in the lab. Um, those of you that have lab right after this, I will meet you in CA building across the road, over the bridge. I got to double check what room. Um, and next week, I will pick up right here. Yes. Can you speak up? I can't hear you. Yeah, I'll put links right in Brightspace for the recordings.